What's up guys? Thanks for joining me for another video tutorial. Just a little disclaimer I'm going to start putting at the beginning of the videos. Uh, my videos are generally long form and they're not scripted. So even if there's a little bit of a setup beforehand, if I start modeling something beforehand, um, I don't script anything. So uh, the main point of my videos is to give you a method of doing something, explain why it might be a better way of doing it, or you know, things of that nature. And in this particular video, the topic I'm going to be tackling is creating the threads for a bolt, but doing it in Substance Painter rather than having to uh, model it here inside of Maya or Blender or whatever you're going to be using. And the purpose for that is, let's say this is going to be for like a game asset. Obviously, in a game, if you're going to model a bolt that's going to go on something, in most cases, unless you need a severe close-up of it, in most cases, you're not going to want to actually model those threads that you see here on the uh, on the bolt. Um, you're going to want them to just be part of the texture. But what I see a lot of artists do, and it's a perfectly valid way of doing it, is for the high poly version that they'll then bake down to the low, they'll actually model those threads in, and then they'll bake those threads onto the low poly model. And in my opinion, that's just a lot of extra unnecessary work. Because if you don't know, uh, I'm sure you know some of you may have already done this and dealt with this in the past. Whenever you try to model uh, threading onto a bolt or something that needs this kind of threads, it's really kind of a pain to get good topology and good um, like shading, so that when you're you know rotating around the model, you don't get a lot of weird pinching and things like that. And it's just not fun. It's not the best thing. Um, and it can be very tedious to get it, especially on something like this where the uh, the threading isn't all the same size. You see it gets a little bit smaller here at the top and then toward the bottom it gets even more tapered inward like that. So basically what I'm going to be tackling is a way to do this in a very easy, very quick, and non-destructive way inside of Substance Painter so that you can get, um, you can get your work done more quickly, more efficiently, that kind of stuff. So this is the bolt that we're going to be using as our template, as a reference uh, to, to try to you know replicate inside of Substance Painter. And I already went ahead and modeled it. I went ahead and did a high poly version and I did a low poly version as well. But you'll notice right away with the high poly, obviously I didn't model the threading. What I did instead is I modeled the overall general shape of the outside of the threading for the, for the bolt. Um, but didn't actually do any of the, the threading itself. So this is my main shape for the high poly, and that's going to translate well onto the low poly, which is this. It's basically the exact same mesh, just you know, down res quite a bit. Uh, I haven't UV mapped it yet, though, because that's a pretty key part of doing this, um, this quick method. So first thing we're going to do is go ahead and lay out the UVs for this guy. So I'll get my UV toolkit up, get my UV editor and then we're going to start with the camera base projection that's what i always start with and then if i turn on my hard edge viewer it'll basically show me where i have all my hard edges and that's exactly where i want them so i'm going to go ahead and just run a script that i have here to select all the hard edges and cut them in one button otherwise you could go through and manually select all your hard edges and then make a uv seam or you could use um, you know select use constraints and select via hard edges but I've just got a quick script that'll do it in one click. So my hard edges are cut. I've got these, you can see they're white edges for the uh, UV seams. And now I just have to start making some other seams where it makes sense. So I'm gonna basically just cut off the top and the bottom here. See if I can get a contiguous line. Yes, I can. So I'll go ahead and cut those. I'm gonna cut here. And this part isn't super duper important. The main thing that we're focusing on for this particular tutorial is going to be this guy right here. So I'll go ahead and just make one cut straight down the middle. And you'll notice when I go to unfold this, it's going to give me a, like a little bit of a curved shape here, which is not what I want for the purpose of what we're going to be doing in this video. In this video, uh, in this tutorial, in this method, you're going to need this to be a perfectly straight UV shell. So I'll go ahead and orient it. It's going to do its best to orient it either vertically or horizontally. And then from there, I'm going to go ahead and do a straighten UVs. And I have it set to a rather high threshold, 45 degrees. That way I know it's for sure I'm going to straighten this out perfectly. And then from here, I can try to straighten this. Uh, I can try to unfold this 
along either the U or the V to get a more, you know, accurate uh, representation in 2D space as far as like proportionality goes. Uh, in this case, I know I'm going to be unfolding it in the U direction to give me that better proportionality. And what I mean by that is if we look at our checkers, oh, that's a little too dense. Let's try this. Let's try to bring this down to like a 256. So my checkers, my squares are really square here, but then I come down here and they're pretty squashed in the vertical direction, or in this case, in the U direction. Actually, let's just, let's fix that real quick so that it's more in line with the actual model. And we'll darken it up just a little bit so we can see what's happening. So what I, could, what I do here is I unfold this along, in this case, the V, which is the vertical direction. It's going to unfold it based on the proportionality of the model. And so this gives me a better, more accurate representation in 2D. So I've got this guy unfolded. Now it's perfectly straight. Uh, well, almost. After that last unfold, it did kind of give it a little bit of a bend on the top and bottom. So we'll do one more straighten UVs. And now we know it's perfectly straight and we can move on to unfolding the rest. So the rest of this, we're going to go ahead and just unfold. This one also has a little bit of the same problem. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and straighten this one out, though, and not do anything else to it because it's it looks like it's good proportionally. And the rest of it should be fine. Oh, you know what? I did miss one section in here. I missed one of these guys, so we'll go ahead and cut this and unfold it. And then we'll just do the same thing. This one's going to be a little bit more difficult to straighten out. We can try to do an optimize and see if it gets close to straight. And it's fairly close. We'll try this here and it doesn't quite do what I want it to. So there's many different methods you could use to straighten this out. Uh, I'm going to use a script that'll do it in just a couple seconds because it's really not the main focus of this video. And then we will unfold this along the U direction and straighten it again. Okay. So I've got all my shells. I'm going to go ahead and select them and then do an automatic layout. Make sure that I have all my stuff set up. Pre-rotation, I don't think I need to mess with because everything's already vertical. And scaling, we're going to make sure we preserve those 3D ratios so that the uh, texel density is uniform across the mesh. And then we'll use these settings here to get a good layout with good shell padding and tile padding. Go ahead and hit layout. And this is good enough, completely fine. I would say maybe I can orient this a little bit better like that. Maybe this one too. And we'll go ahead and orient these as well. This one's going to be a little bit of trouble. So we'll grab this guy here, orient to edges. And boom, we're golden. Okay, so we've got a perfect layout for this guy right here. And all we have to do now is go ahead and export it. I've already assigned a material to this uh, that's going to be used inside of painter you'll see it as one of my um texture sets okay so we're going to export this i'm just going to overwrite one that i exported earlier when i was setting up this project make sure my tangents and binormals are turned on and uh for the high poly we're going to do the same thing although in maya there's a cool uh trick right now i have smooth mesh preview turned on so it gives me this really nice smooth um you know subdivided look without showing me the actual subdivided geometry so what i can do here is go to file export selection and make sure i have smooth mesh turned off and that means that when i export this for my high poly it's going to go ahead and actually tessellate it it's going to subdivide it based on what it looks like here in the viewport right now and it's going to give me a little error when i do it it's going to say warning smooth meshes are tessellated that's perfect that's exactly what i wanted to happen and now we can go ahead and open up substance painter and start a new project. So we'll go new. I set this to 2048 just so we can see a little bit better in the video. We'll grab my bolt low and we'll go ahead and open that up. And then we're just going to do a quick little bake right here. I don't need an ID map and I'll leave it there. everything else the same. We'll do a 2048 maps and we'll grab our high poly mesh to bake from. And we're going to turn on super sampling, 4x anti-aliasing, and I think everything else is good enough. This is actually perfect. So I should get a perfect bake right away. Actually, I missed a step. Let me go back. 
for my high poly, or sorry, for my low poly, especially because we straightened out meshes or uh, UV shells that weren't naturally straight when unfolded. We're going to want to make sure um, we triangulate everything. You should always triangulate your low poly uh, hard surface meshes before texturing anyway, uh, but especially if there's any form of distortion in your UVs, otherwise this can be problematic later on. So we'll go ahead and triangulate and then we'll redo that export. Again, these aren't scripted, so I'll, I might have some uh, mistakes here and there. Okay, so we'll go ahead and re-import that mesh, get it triangulated, awesome. And now we'll go ahead and bake, and it should be very fast. Yeah, it's going real quick. Cool. So I'm not gonna have to worry about any kind of bake fixes or anything like that. All right, so we have our starting point for, for Painter. Uh, so now we're going to tackle how to get the threading to show up on the mesh. So this is my general uh, workflow. It's it's pretty easy to set up, and I use it for basically every project where there's any kind of threading or bolt. So first thing we're going to start off with is a fill layer, and that fill layer is only going to have the height channel active. So we'll just alt click on the height channel, and we're going to bring the height value down. I'm gonna doesn't really matter where right now, we can always adjust this later, but I'm gonna bring it down pretty far just so we can make sure we actually see what's happening very easily. And on this fill layer, we're gonna name it threads. And we're going to add a black mask, right click, add black mask. And then on that mask, we're gonna right click and add a fill. That happened really fast. I don't know what happened, but <laughs> it worked. Okay, so we have a fill. And in that fill, we're gonna go ahead and add uh, a gradient so that we can, um, we can modulate a thread pattern. So the gradient we're gonna look for is, I already typed it in here, but basically just type in, type in gradient. And there's two main gradients you can look for here. It's gonna be either this one here, gradient linear two or gradient linear three. And I'll show you the difference real quick. Um, we'll start with gradient linear three. And if I alt click on my mask, it's gonna show me what the actual mask looks like on my 2D view. Unfortunately, it won't show the whole thing because I don't have any UV shells in these empty spaces. But we'll go ahead and start scaling this down. I'm going to scale it down real small, and you'll see what that looks like. It's basically a perfectly straight gradient that goes to the middle and then goes right back down in the opposite direction. Gradient linear 2 is a little bit more rounded. It's a little more smooth. And if we go ahead and make it really, really small, and I'm going to turn off the mask view and go back into material view. We'll see what it looks like in here. So as you can see, this is like basically a perfectly straight up and down flat. Um, well, I guess it's more of like a 45 degree angle uh, threading here. So we can go ahead and mess with the size until we get it to somewhere pretty similar to this. I don't know the pitch of this exact thread, so we're just going to kind of estimate it. I'm not that worried about it being, you know, a perfect one-to-one -one representation of exactly how many threads are in here. As long as it's close, I think that's fine. And then the last thing we're going to do to set this up is I'm going to start rotating this just a little bit. And then we'll rotate around the camera. We're going to orbit until we find the seam, which is right here. And this works really well because of the fact that we straightened out this UV shell perfectly. So now all I have to do is I can I can try zooming in real close and editing the rotation of this manually, right? But it's it's hard to get it perfect. So if you ever need a little bit more precision control, you can zoom, well, basically pull the camera over here somewhere, right? Like really far away from where we're actually rotating. Zoom in really far and then you get a lot more precision control from a larger mouse movement. So basically, I just wanna go until I don't really see that that uh, seam anymore. Now close up, you're almost never gonna completely get rid of the seam. You can try adding maybe like a an empty blur filter sometimes makes it work, where you actually set the blur to zero, but in this case, that seam's basically always gonna be there to some extent, but you're never gonna be that close. And from this distance, that seam is basically invisible. Like it's it's there, but it's not it's not all that much to worry about. We can still go through and 
adjust it even more if we need to later on, get it closer and closer. And it looks like right here, it's going to be a little problematic, but that's fine because we're going to be using a gradient to get rid of the top here as well as the bottom. Okay. So now that we have the threads set up, we can do a couple of things. We can, if let's say we want to keep this like a really pointy type of thread the way it is now, we can leave this alone or I can do some things to start kind of modulating it. First, I could add maybe like a levels adjustment to it and I can clamp the levels to flatten out the edge of the, uh, the thread. And maybe I could do the same thing with the inside to make it, you know, thinner threads, something like that. Or I can just go with a different gradient. We'll go back to that gradient two, give me more of like a rounded look. And then we'll do the same thing. Maybe I can add some levels to it where I can pull in these values and we get something like that. I think for this particular case, however, um, oh, you know what? It's pulling in the wrong direction. Let's let's do an invert. There we go. So this would give us this would give us something kind of similar to this look here, but it's still a little too round and not quite pointy enough. So in this case, what I think I'm going to do is I'll stick with my gradient linear three, but I'm going to add a blur to it just to give it a little bit more roundness and then we'll add that levels adjustment in and we'll bring it to about where it looks like it needs to be to match up with this right here. And again, it's not going to be perfect. Um, let's see if maybe this, maybe this blur, okay, we don't want blur wrap. Let's maybe add another empty blur on top. Okay, it looks like this is going to give us a little bit of an issue. Let's see where that's happening. Looks like it's mostly happening because of this blur that I'm adding here, which unfortunately, Substance Painter will only blur in 2D space with a regular blur filter, uh, which is kind of annoying. So maybe there's a, a better way to blur that. Um, but in this case, I guess we're just going to have to stick with the gradient linear to, to give us a better result. So we'll clamp that in. And maybe if I, I think, I think that looks pretty good. That's pretty close. And then maybe a slight blur just to kind of round out the, uh, the corners of where, where it's machined in and it's more recessed in there. So now we can go back in, we can adjust this height level you know, to wherever we want. We'll still leave it pretty, pretty low in there. So the whole point of this being a negative height is that I want this to be um, basically pulling, uh, pulling the, or not pulling. It's it's like it's cutting the metal to be this shape, if that makes sense. And let me see. Yeah, we did need that inverted. Okay. So now we've got the thread set up and we just have to make sure we put it in the right place. So all we got to do now is we're going to select the whole layer. We're going to hit control G to group it. We'll call this group thread group. Oops. Now the thread group, we're going to go ahead and add a black mask on as well. And then in that black mask, we're going to start with paint. Actually, you know what? Normally I would start with a paint, but because of the fact that if we see right here on our reference, the threading does, you know, it tapers out, but then it abruptly ends about halfway down this part right here, which means I don't want the white part of my mask to go all the way down to the bottom. I want it to stop right about here. So what I'll do instead of a paint is I'm going to add a fill and it's going to be a white fill and we're going to turn off UV wrap and we're basically just going to fit that into this UV shell. And we're going to pull this down right up until it gets to the edge of the little bevel taper thing here, right about there. And then at the bottom, we're going to do the same thing until we're at about the halfway point, halfway down, maybe right about there. 
So we have the thread starting in this spot, ending here. And then the last thing we need to do in order to contain this and make it look good is you'll notice at the top here, it's, it's really harsh, this transition, right? There's going to be this seam where the height kind of meshes with what's going on above it. So all I've got to do is on top of this fill here, and if we look at the uh, the mask itself, this can show us what's actually happening. It's it's basically completely black to completely white. I want to give it a little bit more of a, you know, a gradient transition. So we'll add another fill. In this one, we're going to do linear gradient one. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to turn off UV wrap repeat to, to none. And we're basically just going to move it into place. So I, what I want to happen is I want the bottom of the gradient to match up perfectly with this black and white line or as perfectly as I can get it. So we're basically just going to pull this down until there's no more white. And that's perfect. Okay. And we can pull this just outside the shell. Same thing here. And at this point, what I'm trying to do is taper off the height a little bit so we can basically adjust where that gradient starts and ends. And I feel like right here is probably a decent place. So there's no more of a harsh line right there. Now it's going to be, um, you know, a softer tapered transition. And we'll do the same thing to the top. Instead of creating a new fill, though, I'm just going to hover my mouse over my layer stack and hit Control D with this gradient linear selected. Control D to duplicate it. And I'm just going to basically move it up, rotate it, and then we'll do the same thing. I want to pull this down and then pull it up right until the white line is gone. And this one I feel like probably doesn't need to be tapered quite as far. Oops. So I can maybe pull this in. Take a look at it like that. And there we go. Now, again, this is not for something where you're going to be doing a super close up, right? If you did need a close up, then you might as well just model all of these threads and call it a day. But for our purposes, you know, we want to save memory. We want to make sure that this doesn't take up too much and it still looks good. So we've got our thread set up. And I think we're at a really good starting place. Now, I know I've said starting place a bunch of times so far, but basically what we're trying to do as well in this video, besides just making the thread information, is we also want to make it look realistic. We want to make it look good in the scene as well. So how do we do that? Well, in this case, I think I'm just going to use one of the built-in smart materials. So we'll go ahead and make sure we change this to – actually, I'm going to do show all. And we'll do uh, painted steel. Steel gun painted, I feel like that's a pretty good um, material to use. Okay, and then we just have to kind of go in and analyze what this material looks like. Now, this threading is going to have to go inside this, um, this group here, and you'll see why here in a moment. Uh, without that, it's uh, <laughs> you're not going to see it because of the way that the... Um, the height blending mode is set up for the whole group. And in a lot of cases, you don't want to change this from normal, right? If you want to, if you want to have it as linear dodge, anything that's below it, so if you, if you have any other height information below this group, it's going to show up in this material as well because we have this blending mode set to linear dodge. So if I had like a layer, a height layer with a whole bunch of bumps or something, let's just throw on a, I don't know, Perlin noise just as an example we'll crank this tiling way down and make it bumpy right we have this bumpy material on here but i don't want it to show up in this particular material i'm going to have to change my blending mode for the height channel from linear dodge which is the default to normal so now those bumps are no longer showing up in this material sorry a little bit of a side tangent there <clears throat> So these scratches, it looks like they've already got a, a smart uh, metal edgeware set up here. But what I think I'm going to do, let's see. So we have the painted steel or the, the base paint layer. And I want the steel 
underneath to kind of show on the external parts like the edges and a uh, metal edge wear is really a nice generator to use it looks like that's what they're using here but the uh, the micro details aren't turned on so we're not going to really get an accurate representation in here so I, instead of using this scratches layer i'm going to create a new scratches layer so let's say it's a metal steel I'm just going to go with something really simple. I'm just going to make it like a, you know, blue-ish steel. Slightly rough, but a little bit shiny. And then I also want to crank up my specular quality a little bit so we get a nicer looking material here. So this is we'll just pretend this is the underlying steel that we want to cut away with our scratches and scrapes on the edges. I'll also bring this height value down just a tad. So we'll add a black mask to this, and then we're going to go ahead and add a generator. We'll do the metal edge wear. And we can bring this wear level way down until it's just barely touching just the edges here. And even there, it's still, still quite a bit. Let's see. Curvature weight. We can bring this, this down. And I think that looks fairly decent. Maybe I could take away a little bit more, but we'll get, we'll use this as a nice starting point, but you'll see here that it's not really affecting the threads themselves, which is what we want. We want these threads to also be kind of nicked and scraped along the outside edges of them. So what I can do is at the top of my thread group, um, a lot of the times you're going to have height details, not just from one layer, but let's say I had a bunch of layers with different threads, different um, designs and things on there. Um, I want all that height information to be included in this metal edge wear for where it's going to be, you know, basing those scratches and stuff off of. So what I can do is I can add a fill layer. It can be fill. It can be a paint layer. It doesn't matter because we're not actually going to be turning on any of these channels for this layer. It's basically going to be an empty layer. And in the height channel, if we set the blend mode from linear dodge and we change it to pass through. This is now going to be passing all of the height information from anything below it up to wherever we're going to reference it. And this is going to be using anchor points. So we'll call this height, oh, we'll call this, uh, yeah, we'll call it height pass through. I use this type of layer in my projects basically 100% of the time because I'm always going to be adding height details and stuff that I don't want to worry about modeling um, because it's just it just saves a lot of time so this height pass through layer it's set to pass through and the last thing we have to do to it is right click and add an anchor point so now this anchor point is going to be referencing whatever in this layer and in this case it's all the height information of whatever's below it and we're going to be passing that up to our metal edge wear by using this micro details uh, property here we're going to turn on micro height because we're using the height channel for all of our height details. And then we're going to scroll down here and in the micro height channel box, we're going to click on it and we're going to grab the anchor point that we just created. And then we're also going to make sure that the reference channel is the channel that we want to reference. In this case, we want to reference the height channel because that's where all of our information is. And we're going to change this little drop down from base color to height. So already you can kind of see it's starting to do it. Let me go ahead and turn that off. And then on and you can start to see if I crank up the height details intensity you can see it a lot better I mess with the curvature intensity and the height details AO radius and stuff uh, it does help you kind of dial it in because it's also generating like a false ambient occlusion map based off of this height information as well and now we have nicks and scrapes along our threads and it looks pretty natural it looks like something that would have actually happened in real life and so far we're working 100 percent procedurally i haven't painted anything right the last thing that i would usually do to make this a little bit more realistic and you can do a lot more to it um, but generally there's going to be some kind of like dirt or dust layer right so this would be our scratches and then this will be our dirt so pretty simple, straightforward for this. 
Dirt's going to be a non-metallic uh, material. Roughness is going to be all the way up because it's basically fully matte. This is not going to be shiny dirt or mud. It's just going to be, you know, flat matte dirt. And then we'll give it a generic dirt color. We'll go somewhere around here. Yeah, it looks okay. And we're basically going to do the same thing. We're going to create a black mask and a generator, but this time we're going to use the built-in dirt generator, which I think is a really nice dirt generator. It kind of uses the uh, ambient occlusion map as its main driver for where to place the dirt. And then we can basically just, you know, play with these values, bring down the dirt level. If, if we want to see what's going on under here a little bit better too, we can change the uh, environment alignment to camera and then just bring the in the environment to where we want to see the lighting a little bit better. Okay, so in here we're going to just modulate this a little bit. We're going to change the uh, the contrast, something like that. We can change how much grunge there is. I really love this this generator. It's really nice. You can also use your own custom grunge maps in basically all of these generators. We can change the grunge scale, something closer to the size that makes sense for a bolt of this size. But again, you're not seeing any dirt, you know, stuck in these crevices between these threads, which if this has been sitting around for a while, like it makes sense. There should probably be a little bit of dirt in there unless it's a lot of action. It gets, gets used a lot, but we're going to put a little bit of dirt just in these recesses doing the same thing. We're going to add micro details, turn on our micro height. We're going to scroll down to the micro height box, grab the height path through anchor, and then we're going to change to the height channel for the for where we're referencing and then from here same thing we can just mess with the depth we can mess with the radius something like that and it basically just gives us a little bit more of a pop right it looks a little bit better it's not so bland it doesn't look like if i was to turn these off these threads are just kind of sitting there right they don't they don't look like anything more than just in addition to the normal map, if I turned my uh, material view to base color view instead, this is still just a very dull, simple, uh, you know, base color map. But as soon as I enable the scratches and the dirt, you can see that it starts to affect the base color map as well. It's not just going to be on the uh, the normals. So just an idea for how to make your threading look a little bit more realistic, even though we did, we basically procedurally constructed the threads here inside of Painter. And the great thing about this setup, because we're using anchor points and stuff, I can make changes to my threads on the fly if I want, and it's it's still going to affect the dirt and the extra scratches here. If I did want to go ahead and change back to, I don't know, let's say we, we want it to be more like this and we don't want it to have any pointiness we still want it to be round or we want it to be fully pointy and pulled apart like this or i want to change the size of the threads altogether by doing something like this you can see that it's still all those things the scratches and the uh the dirt and stuff uh, you may have to go back in and modulate that a little bit. So like I might have to go in and crank up the height details intensity for it to still catch that. But it's still following everything that I'm doing down here. And that's because we're using this anchor point for the height pass through. So there you go. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Um, I feel like I kind of rambled a little bit there. But uh, if you found this helpful let me know in the comments if you have any questions let me know if uh, if i glossed over anything or went too fast let me know or honestly if this tutorial sucked and it was too long and you didn't enjoy it that's fine too again my my tutorials aren't for everybody they're always long form they're not scripted so uh, i appreciate you watching and i really hope that this was helpful and you know can kind of help you speed up your workflow a little bit have a great day